Thank you and good evening. My guest tonight is one of the theater's most sought after artists. He made his Broadway debut as Roger in Rent and has gone on to play such roles as Jan in the Beach Boys musical Good Vibrations, Bob Gordio in Jersey Boys, Buddy in Elf the Musical, and Fierro in Wicked. Off-Broadway at second stage, he was seen as Franz in the musical The Blue Flower and as Zach in Lincoln Center Theater's musical Happiness under the direction of Susan Stroman. He wowed audiences as Jack Chesney in City Center Encore's production of Frank Lesser's Where's Charlie? He is currently heating up the small screen as newspaper editor Lucas Goodwin in the smash hit Netflix series House of Cards, co-starring Kevin Spacey and Robin Wright. He can be heard on numerous cartoons, most notably as the voice of Poppy on Nickelodeon's Go Diego Go, Timmy on Winx Club, and Jeremy Desmond's Man of the People. He is the star and producer of the new indie film, The Last Day of August, and is about to return to Broadway, creating the role of lawyer Jake Brigance in the John Grisham thriller, A Time to Kill, opening October 20th at the Golden Theater. He is a graduate of Williams College, and he is married to the multi-talented and gorgeous Broadway star, Miss Stephanie J. Block, who is here tonight. Please welcome Sebastian Arcellus. Hi, folks. Thanks for coming out. Make yourself comfortable. The only thing in it that's true is the gorgeous Stephanie J. Block. Oh, yes. That's the only piece of true information. So listen there, so hi there. First of all, I, along with millions of others, are addicted to House of Cards. Oh, gosh. We are so excited that uh, the viewing public has embraced the show as they have. It was a remarkable experience. It has been uh, to see sort of how season one sort of rolled out. And uh, this last year and a half has been a truly, truly remarkable. And, and it's been a dream, professionally. So I'm thrilled to be a part of the show. and. Uh, and we're working hard at season two now, so I think you'll all be excited about where it's headed. So take me back to the beginning. How were you cast? You know, it was, uh, it actually, it turned out to be a, a few month process. Um, uh, a year and a half ago in December, I went in originally for a different character. Actually, I ended up auditioning for three separate characters on the show. Um, Julie Schubert's office brought me in. Uh, she was working alongside Lorraine Mayfield. And uh, the minute I read the script, I said, this is going to be something special. And of course, when you see that David Fincher is in, at the helm, and of course, Kevin Spacey, uh, and Robin Wright, and Bo Willeman, and the list goes on and on, you know that you're in for something truly uh, you know, awe-inspiring. Anyway, I read the script, and I thought it was just delicious. Uh, yeah, that's the word. It was just, just yummy. These are all food analogies. Anyway. Um, he's a brilliant writer. Oh, he's, Bo is an amazing writer. For those of you who uh, have seen the show, you know, he also, of, co of course, wrote Farragut North, which then he made into the film uh, starring Ryan Gosling. And uh, anyway, I went in for this particular character who I did not obviously get cast in. And I went in for a few, a few rounds of that, uh, got towards the end there, and then got the call to come in for two separate characters sort of in the same week. A couple of months later, I thought once they cast uh, the gentleman who's playing that role that I uh, that I did not get. Um, Can you tell us the role? Yeah, it's going to be funny though. Now, I mean, yeah, I went in originally for Doug Stamper, which makes very little sense <laughs> for those of you who have seen the show, uh, who's the chief of staff uh, for Ke Kevin Spacey. And um, so when they cast Michael, who is literally just perfect in that role, um, I thought it was over, you know. But the irony is. When I read the script originally, though I was thrilled to go in for Doug, um, it was Lucas that I said, oh, you know, that's actually instinctively the character that I would have thought I would be most appropriate for. Um, and lo and behold, I did audition for that and uh, went in a couple more times for, for Lucas, and they brought me back in to do a chemistry test with Kate you know, Mara, and, uh, and, and the rest is, is you know, it's history. Well, I wasn't going to use that yeah, word. I, know, I, I, I caught I know. myself. I got it's caught. a good word, though. It's a good word. I got caught. Yeah. And then, um, so it's funny how how instinctive reactions to things lead, you know, sort of come around. You know, originally, yeah, I did really instinctively think that Lucas was was the, the role that I think 
I was most appropriate for, and as it turned out, I ended up getting cast. So, but they never auditioned you originally for that role, did they? They. It was the last role that I auditioned for. Interesting. Yeah. So it was Stamper. I ended up auditioning for Remy Danton, yeah. interestingly as well, which, if you've seen the show, also makes little sense. And um, and then when I got to audition for for Lucas, it just sort of fit. And Julie was really a champion. She coached me through. For those of you who have auditioned for Julie Schubert, she really is a remarkable casting director. Uh, that really takes all the worry and the nerves out of the system and just focuses on the work and makes it a work session, really. And so she really coached me through it, and we got some notes from David. Uh, well, funny story, actually. Uh, before my final audition, one of the scenes, of course, was with Kate, and I had to be yeah. fairly charming with her and such. And the one note I, that came down the pike from David was, smile less. Which, of course, if you know David, <laughs> you know, it makes sense. And, uh, and I was like, well, now how am I going to be charming and yet not rely on that, that smile? Anyway, so um, we found our way. But uh, it, was a great, it was a great note to get from someone that you, you, know, you admire so much to hear, oh, yeah, of course, we're not doing a rom-com. We're doing a David Fincher political thriller. Smile less. So when you auditioned with, when you worked with Julie on this, is that typical of how TV works? So I know we have a lot of actors in the house who work on television, would like to work on television and work on a series. So going in for House of Cards and working on these different characters during the, during the audition process, is it how it's usually done? You know, it depends. I mean, a lot of the time you go in and it was so different about auditioning for a musical and a television series is that oftentimes when you, when you audition for a musical, you know, you've got your song or your second song or even your 32 bars and then your scenes and second and third scenes. And so you get out of there and you feel like you accomplished something even if you didn't get the part. You're like, well, I'm sweating. And I <laughs> laid it out there for them and they know who I am and what I'm capable of. A lot of times when you're auditioning for TV or film, it's a 30-second process or a minute. Or if you're lucky, you get to do it a, a second time or read the second scene. You know, uh, it's a different thing. So when you get out of that room, sometimes you feel like, I want to go back in and do it again now, now that the nerves are out of the way. Or, um, or oh, I just wish that I could show them that I can do, you know, but it's not quite like that. The joy of working with Julie on this was she really did let you sort of, she stripped away, you know, she kept your best choices but stripped away all the extra stuff and really focused on getting the best performance possible. So 10 minutes later, you know, you really feel like you worked hard to, to put the best product out there for them to consider. Now, are you put on camera? Is that how it's done? That's right. Uh, you know, it was sort of interesting. I'd never actually met David in the process, um, or Bo. Uh, it was about six or seven times I was put on camera, and the notes, uh, as, as I mentioned before, came through. And um, it was that final audition where I met with Kate where, um, where it felt really personal because at that stage I was working with another actress but um, but no it was it was all via camera and the reality is you know the re one of the many many reasons why David Fincher and Bo Willimon and of course Kevin are so brilliant is that they they know like they know what they want and they're the smartest guys in the room and so when it comes down to casting and I don't want to speak for them obviously but they can really pinpoint, and I think part of the reason why the show works so wonderfully is that they really pinpoint authenticity. And they, they can strip away all the extra stuff and find the most direct route or solution to a problem. Not that casting is a problem, but, you know? And, and we can get into this later, but the reality is, in another life of mine, I might very well have been a newspaper editor or uh, a politician or somehow involved in that world, because for a long time, uh, I was in that world. Uh, I worked on a political campaign when I was in college. I worked for uh, international business firms, and I studied political science in college, and really soaked up that world. And there was a moment where I wanted to be a writer or a journalist. It, it's all part of sort of my DNA in there somewhere. So sure. when, it, when it came time to, let me put it this way, in a perfect world, Ten years ago, I was like, "Gosh, if I could just be in the West Wing, it would, it would put together all of my personal interests and my professional interests into one. It wouldn't that just be a beautiful package?" Of course, that didn't happen. But I did end up getting cast in the anti-West Wing. 
totally entirely different but still of that world and it's just funny for me and truly invigorating to to be in a position where i can be part of a show that's it's not only remarkably written and put together and 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 historic in some sense um in many senses uh, but also that happens to be about the very things that i love now not you know power and intrigue and and, and well, you love those too. I think we all do. You know, any number of yeah. really bad, bad things. But, uh, but yeah, that world, you know, which just is, is, is part of me. You know, I go down to D.C. My wife and I always comment on D.C. as being this sort of awe-inspiring city. Um, it was designed to, you know, uh, create awe amongst its visitors. A tidbit that I know from the West Wing. And, uh, and so it's a spe- it holds a special place uh, for me that uh, it's really lovely to be able to engage in the show. Well, talk about the role, what makes him so interesting to play, and how he's grown for you. Oh, yeah. Well, part of the reason why I think I responded to him initially, um, besides the fact that I think his uh, uh, description in the original script was something like, Lucas Goodwin, a mid-30s, frumpy, if appealing, uh, <laughs> newspaper editor, or if attractive, I don't know, the exact words. But... Uh, Part of the reason why I love him is that he is good, inherently. And not that there aren't nuggets of goodness in each of the characters, but the tone of our show is inherently dark, and and these characters are, I don't know if you would say compromised, because in some sense they're empowered by their particular qualities, but what's lovely for, for me about him is that he is at least trying through his work and his personal life, to be as pure as possible. To be, he is an idealist. He is a guy that came into this business, uh, I've said before, uh, with the most idealistic and lofty goals in mind, which is to put out a daily newspaper that you can be proud of and that warrants you know, national, if not global, attention. And you know, the kind of guy that probably got into journalism because he saw or read All the President's Men, or you know, Gay uh, The Kingdom of the Power about the New York Times, and really inherently wants to strive to make something special on a daily basis. That said, as an editor, you have to be a, a pragmatist. So, you know, every day you gotta get that thing done, and you gotta do it as a, you, know, you have to rally your troops and be a coach, and, and what I love about him is that he is the, both those things sort of working in tandem. He's an idealist, he's a pragmatist who uh, sort of doesn't have time for dilly-dallying, but at the same time can recognize the goodness in other people, which is why I think he responds to Zoe the way he does, despite the fact that Zoe is obviously who she is and does what she does. Um, he does recognize something else in her, I think, that, uh, which is why he's so drawn to her. So um, one word that... Uh, that always sort of stands out is he has a, a, it's his ethos. You know, he has a moral code that he's striving towards. Um, And as the season progresses, obviously towards the end of the season, um, all of that is is tested. And and he's put in a position where he has to start making choices that that have fairly dire consequences. So for me to be able to ride that train with Bo and David and and all the subsequent writers on the team and the cast was really exciting. And we're poised to do some really exciting things in season two, which I can't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can tell them. They won't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, exactly. Working with David Fincher, uh, uh, he directed the first two episodes? That's correct. What was that like? Because he produces the series. That's right. And directed the first two. So what was it like working under his tutelage? It's truly remarkable. Like I said, he is the smartest man in the room. He may very well be the smartest man in the industry, as far as I'm concerned. You know, I mean, of course, the, the litany of films that he's made, which are, are just out of this world. And he's, I think, he sort of lives in these, in my opinion, these sort of two worlds. He's an artist to the utmost degree. And he's a technician. I mean, he's a one-man crew, you know? Uh, from story to to picture, of course, to uh, to lighting, to everything. I mean, he could do it all. And what he does is he inspires people to do their best 
every day. I mean, there's a different tone on set when he's around, and it's not, it's not. The reality is, he's actually he's really funny and 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 cool and laid back and 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 jokey, but he again he just inspires everyone's best. Every little detail, he knows exactly what he wants, which really does change the way a day progresses. You know, when a man knows what he's looking for, then it cuts away all inefficiency and creates for a very pointed and open and engaging work environment. Um, but at the same time, he's also open to the unexpected. You know, so he. He's famous, of course, for allegedly doing a lot of takes. And, of course, that has happened in his film career. And also, you know, we were limited to a certain degree in, on, on a TV schedule as to how many takes we could do. But, of course, there are some scenes that require many takes and some that require fewer. I, I think I listened to an interview of his once where he said, why are we going to create this world? And, I don't, again, I don't want to speak for him, but why are we going to bring all the actors out here, pay for all this production, do all this that we're doing, so that we can tell the actors to do two takes and then we're moving on. He's like, let's create an environment where everyone gets to really do the best they can. And, and again, he knows what he wants and it's prolific and it's extensive, but I think he really does, I mean, he loves those little surprises that happen. And, he, and along the way, he's also thinking and he's changing things and doing things. Um, but uh, it was, it was, it was, those two episodes were something special for all of us because we knew we were part of something special that we couldn't really talk about to the world and we knew that he was in the room. So, you know, here's the thing. Coming from theater and having done a little film TV that I had at that time, it was the most comforting thing for me to work with David Fincher, despite the fact that it's nerve-wracking to work in that immediately with someone like David Fincher. <laughs> it was totally comforting because for me, it was the most theater-like experience I could have imagined because we were doing it again and again and again and honing the skill and changing it and throwing something into the pot and stirring it up and seeing what's next. And so what was great about it was that I knew inherently we were not going to stop until he got what he wanted. And it's not that he was having to dig to get it. It was that you know that he's going to keep working on it until he's got what, he's, what, he, what he wants. Yeah, because I was going to ask you, you had primarily done all theater up until the point of TV. For the most part, yeah. I mean, a couple things here and there. But, and but we've had a lot of television actors here, Vincent D'Onofrio, David Hyde Pierce, and I asked them what that process was when you're thrown into a whole new world, because you're used to, you know, oh, yeah. the theater world. Yeah. Was it daunting, and, like the first few times on the set of House of Cards? Like, you're working with David Fincher, like you said, it's not just a little director, it is the big director, yeah. it's the big man. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah, of course it was daunting. Of course, you're having difficulty breathing, you know? <laughs> but that said, I don't know how to say this without it sounding sort of odd. I've been waiting for that moment my whole life, you know? I had one, gosh, I'm getting emotional right now? Um, but that's why you do this stuff. That's why you're yeah. creative. That's what Look, you know. I yeah. mean, I spent the last decade gratefully and happily working on Broadway in and off Broadway or whatever, or regionally in all these shows. And it's, it has been and continues to be who I am. Um, somewhere in the back of my mind, I've always wanted to be a part of the film world, the TV world. And this is really, it's TV that's not really TV. So when the call finally came to be a part of something like this, it was daunting. It was nerve-wracking. I mean, you can ask my wife, and she'll probably tell you a thousand stories about that part of it. But it was also... Like, I was, re I was ready. Not ready maybe to actually perform, but ready to sort of em embark on that journey, you know? And uh, I'm not going to lie. I, I, on set, I'm, I'm a fairly eager beaver. So, you know, it could be a 12-hour day, and they say you're wrapped. And I'm like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> like, what are you, what, you sure you don't need me around? Like... Or, like, I'll take a little too long to, like, get out of my, you know, trailer, and I'll just mosey on back to craft services and be like, what scene are you guys doing now? <laughs> you know? So they're like, oh, Sebastian's still here. Also, also, I have to say, <laughs> exactly, like, get the hell out of here, what are you kidding? Um, but also, something that actually put me at ease was, much like Lucas Goodwin, to be frank, one of those seminal 
moments for me was seeing all the presidents mad. It made me want to, not really be a politician from that, but it made me want to dig and be better and change the world and um, and be an actor in some weird sense because Robert Redford was a, a big uh, idol of mine. And uh, the first day on set was in the Washington Herald, which literally we filmed adjacent to the Baltimore Sun. In the built building of the Baltimore Sun, there was all this empty space because newspapers are having a difficult time. And I walked into the set, and I was on the set of All the President's Men. I mean, you know, of course, Don Burke created something remarkable that was of its, of its own ilk, but it felt like I was walking down the, you know, aisle towards Bob Redford's uh, desk, or, you know, Bob Woodward's desk, as it were. And, uh, and I walked into my office, and I found out that I went to Columbia, <laughs> and, <laughs> and there was a, you know, there was a, a card there that said Lucas Goodwin, you know, deputy editor of the Washington Herald, and I stashed a few of those in my pocket. And, uh, <laughs> and it, was, it was like, yeah, okay, I'm, re I'm ready. And then it was just about opening yourself up to whatever David needed, wanted, uh, and 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 then just feeling the scene out with Kate. Um, the first scene I shot was the one in, in the uh, in the kitchen there, and uh, it was something special. It was something special. So I was daunted for sure, but I was I was just jumping off the wall, you know. Dynamite cast. I mean, talk oh, about the cast you work with. Yeah, and so many theater actors. You know, yeah. Boris MacGyver. Uh, I mean, there uh, there are so many. Actors that that have, have, have graced the stage, Larry Pine. Um, uh, I mean, it really is a special group of people. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, look, you walk into that first table read, and and you can't believe. That's when I sort of really was sort of overwhelmed and and, and couldn't breathe. Um, but then again, little nuggets happen. You know, these are real people. You have this image of these people as being sort of some other entity, I don't know how to describe it. And then you meet them and they're just real people trying to do good work. For instance, I met, the, I met David, he's like, hey, what's up? And he sort of says, hey, Sebastian, nice to see you. As if I'd met him before, uh, I had not. He knew me, I knew him, um, <laughs> <laughs> as it were. But then John Melfi, the executive producer, uh, came in, didn't say hello, didn't say nice to meet you, he just extended his hand and said, good job. And I thought, wow, like, I got the gig. You got all the approval that day. I got the gig. And, and from there, it was like, be ready, you know? And David said to the group, he said, look, we're very lucky we got all of our first choices in these roles, so don't F it up. You know, talk about Netflix, because this is a series unlike anything else. I mean, they've sort of reinvented the way people watch television, how the show's being produced, and sort of the um, creative freedom you're sort of given, right, with this show? It's an, extra it's an extraordinary company who are the perfect employers. Because what they, I mean, of course, there's Netflix that basically is the service that provides everybody with everything on the one hand, right? Mm -hmm. um, and on the other, uh, what they're doing with this new original content is, first of all, they've employed really amazing and lovely people to head the original content department. So that is one thing. But beyond that, they basically hire people that they trust and that they know will do great work. And by this I mean David Fincher and Bo Willeman and Kevin Spacey and Robin Wright. And again, the list goes on. And they trust them. So while this venture was beginning, the original content department was developing. So the infrastructure was there, but it wasn't there. And at the same time, they're present, but allowing these creators to express themselves. So there wasn't this heavy network presence that was overlooking the, the process. I mean, they were present and overlooking, but not, um, not in a stifling way. They were letting them do what they had to do. And of course, it's way above my pay grade to understand what all of that really was. But from our perspective, we were provided a platform to create
create the most memorable piece of non-television television that we could in this six month period of time, in this season one. Also, they did the unprecedented thing of green lighting two seasons right up front. You know, David and Bo went to them and a number of other people and again, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn, I think he's spoken about this in other interviews, but they said, look, we want to do, we don't want to do a pilot, we want to do a, a season and can you guarantee that for us? And Netflix turned around and said, how about two? And when you have that kind of support and latitude um, backed by a hugely reputable company that's launching a new wave of television um, and the viewing experience, you sort of can't go wrong. Granted, we're all used to binge viewing, you know? I mean, we see Breaking Bad, you know, seasons one, two, and three in uh, two weeks, and uh, so that infrastructure for TV viewing and movie viewing and whatever had existed. But this was the first time that a show was being delivered like that, all 13 dropped at one time. And thankfully, you know, recently the Emmys acknowledged and, and the industry acknowledged that move as a vibrant and legitimate part of the TV world by, by nominating the show, and, and historically so, in that it was the first first television show to be drama, uh, to be nominated in the drama category that was not delivered on television. I mean, you think back to The Sopranos in 1998 or 99, where it was the first cable show to be nominated. And, and interesting, and this is not to speak down to the networks at all, but it was the first, it wasn't just the first year, but this year happened to be a year where there were no network dramas in that category. And it's just a remarkable evolution of television over the last 15 years. And in this case, eight months, that really feels like something special to be a part of, that sort of m new wave of thinking about stuff. And now you've got Orange is the New Black, and then you've got Ricky Gervais shows coming out, and you've got Amazon Plus and Hulu and all these things that are now evolving and changing the way we, um, we see television. Of course, I just moved and signed up for cable, so it's not like all of the cable is going down the drain. I just paid $200 to sign up for my cable. but. Uh, but it is really something special, a and uh, you know, it, uh, uh, it's their perfect, perfect employer. So, you're starting. You've filmed season two already, right? In the middle of it now. We're in the middle of it now. Yeah. Okay. So, for those of you who know, you're also coming to Broadway. That's right. This season. So, before we get into a time to kill, how are you going to juggle both? I don't know. Okay. Good. <laughs> what do you but think? you will. What you do you will. think? I think you'll be perfect at it. I think it you'll work. be great. It's going to work great. <laughs> Uh, thankfully, uh, everyone involved is, is being very uh, accommodating and patient. Uh, and at the same time, you know, uh, we have to, we have demands that we have to meet. So, yeah. so thankfully, uh, I mean, when I have to pop down to do House of Cards, I will have to pop down and do House of Cards, and and happily so. But uh, but thankfully, uh, Daryl Roth and Eva Price over at Time to Kill are are giving me a little latitude to to be able to meet that wonderful obligation, while also giving me this great opportunity to revisit this role that um, that I helped create two years ago at the Arena Stage yeah. down, down in Washington, D.C., again, back at Washington. See, no, well, So where do you film House of Cards? We film in Baltimore, Okay. Uh, which is, of course, just 45 minutes north of D.C., Okay. and um, has a lot of elements that are very similar to D.C., but that can also double as Philadelphia or you know, the South. And then we pop down to D.C. when necessary. Um, but, you know, production for the for House of Cards has been a bit like a film. I say that like I do them all the time. Um, <laughs> in that, you know, you're not there necessarily five days a week. When I first got the gig, you know, my wife and I thought, wow, okay, so I'll be living in Baltimore and I'll come to you back on the weekends. And as it turned out, like I'd pop down for a day, I'd pop down for two days a week. Or so <clears throat> so it's really wonderful that I'll be able to work on Broadway while also just popping down for a day if necessary. Um, thankfully, it's not shooting in Vancouver or, or LA, you know? So what kind of rehearsal time will you have? So when you shoot like these, like you, you'll be doing Broadway and you'll say, we need you Tuesday to go down to Baltimore to shoot. Is there a, a long rehearsal period or no for the TV show? Um, well, we have the scripts, uh, you know, a couple weeks before uh, we shoot those episodes. We'll do a table read um, 
prior to shooting, of course. Um, and then, you know, you're given your days and your schedule and you show up on set and, and you generally have a, a rehearsal with the director and, 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 and writer and Bo's generally on set for that purpose as well. And we'll, that's what I also found so interesting about doing TV vers uh, versus theater was, you know, we're, as, as theater actors, we come prepared. That's one great thing. We're used to that, which is a great, great gift that you can give yourself and the team, frankly. But <coughs> we're used to rehearsing again and again and again. In this case, you show up on set at 10 or 5 a.m. or whatever it is, <laughs> excuse me, and you have, you run through the scene once, sort of read through it, and then you maybe space it out once. If you're lucky, you'll do it again. But you have to really lock in on where you're going to go almost instinctively. And of course, you could give room for that, and then the director, of course, will guide you through. Um, but I remember remarking to my wife one time, I had this scene in the kitchen of the Washington Herald where I had to make a, a cup of coffee. We made it tea just to make it something different, right? And I had to make tea. This sounds so stupid and mundane, but it's, it's stuff you have to think about. I had to make tea exactly the same way, pouring on the same line, while you know, adjusting your body one way for the camera so you're not covering case face. I mean, there are things that, that you don't think about when you're on stage. You know, you're doing the scene and you're just, you're just going with the flow and you, you feel like you have a command of the space. Here, you have to have a command not only of the space but of your minute details. And that's, that's something that I wasn't as used to. Another strange and bizarre elementary thought <laughs> about film and TV is the elements which you're also not used to unless you're doing outdoor theater, you know? Uh, and then beyond that, you know, if you're doing a night scene, trust me, uh, there was one scene that where I'm, that scene where I'm um, drunk outside waiting for Kate at her doorstep. Uh, we were shooting that scene, I mean, of course it was the middle of the night. Uh, I think it was about 4.30 in the morning. And <laughs> it's fun. Kate turned to me, she's like, my God, you really seem so drunk. I mean, even your eyes are bloodshot. And I was like, it's 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> I'm exhausted. <laughs> you know? Which are things that when you watch a scene, you immediately think it's 9 o'clock, or it's 9.30, or, you know. And these are the small little details about film and TV that are so different from theater that, uh, that were very fun and, to be perfectly frank, new to me in some sense. Were there physical attributes or character ticks that you came up for Lucas as the season progressed? Because I've asked Jim Parsons this when he was here and David Hyde Pierce when Nigel would wipe the chair mm -hmm. and Sheldon's little ticks and Vincent D'Onofrio came up with his ticks for Law and Order when he would bend, you know, looking at the camera or whatever. Did you discover any of those about his character that became him? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, yes. Uh, he is a pen chewer. Uh, you know, whether these things make it on camera or not, I don't know. He's a face rubber, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> constantly, I mean, it's just, he's a coach, right? I mean, he is coaching a team of reporters. And every decision that he has to make, whether in his personal life or, or in a professional, requires judgment, and good judgment, and quick judgment. And so there's a certain energy that I can relate to um, that requires those little those little ticks. I, I was actually one of the things that made me immediately feel very comfortable as Lucas was that I walked into my first um, I walked into my first costume fitting um, uh, <laughs> with Tom, our remarkable costume designer, and uh, I walked into a pair of cords, just sort of a pair of Clark's uh, button-down shirt, and he was like, "Yep." And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, we'll be taking those and those. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we're good. So that's how TV dresses and people so, now. No, literally. <laughs> <laughs> what you bring. What I always laughed about was that half of Lucas was my own wardrobe and half was actually his. Because he and I have, well, he's much more stylish than I am, but, but we have a, a similar sort of sensibility. And, uh, 
So I was immediately grounded in a pair of shoes uh, that I wear, I wore virtually every day, walking around Manhattan from show, you know, audition to audition. Um, a pair of shoes that, interestingly enough, I'm going to call you out, Steph. <laughs> Steph often says those are way too like, like egghead crunchy. Like you can't wear those. <laughs> You know, but they, that's exactly what Lucas is. Uh, a pair of cords that should have gone a long time ago. Um, also, this is a stupid little thing. Again, I, I do have a, a penchant for, for enjoying sort of how wardrobe affects performance. It sounds so, I don't know, actory. But um, I also had a very specific way, I had sound OCD. I had a very specific way of folding my, um, my sleeves. He never had his sleeves down, as far as I was concerned. He's a roll em up kind of guy. I mean, he's wearing a sweater. It is what it is. But, um, but I never, so he was always sort of down and dirty. I always folded them. This was actually a David tip, actually. You know how we used to, we're used to doing, you know, yeah, very nicely. Well, David was like, try this. And you fold them up sort of in one shot, and then sort of rolled up. He's like, it's messy, it's unbothered, you don't think about it. Uh, and I stuck with it the whole way through, and it did. It, it just mattered to me. It was a, it was a, it was an interesting little tidbit. Um, no, because most actors say that their character doesn't fully come around until it's the outfit yeah. that they that they live in. You know, yeah. it just sort of embodies the character. Yeah. It was one day where I uh, came into rehearsal with David, and I just bought a new pair of sneakers, and uh, we were starting to rehearse, and I put my feet up on the desk, and he's like, oh, "You'll wear those. That'll be good." <laughs> I mean, like. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and what's funny is that, of course, the, the sneaker, you know, had a specific style that he that that, you know, yeah. he has a he has a reason for everything. It wasn't just because I happen to have a nice pair of sneakers. So, um, little things like that did sort of infiltrate. Um, and there are other things that uh, that I'd rather keep sort of personal for now. I gotcha. When can we expect season two? I don't know. Okay. Uh, you know, to be. To be honest, I, I don't. They haven't. I don't think decided on the specific delivery schedule or or, sure. or manner of, of delivery. We're shooting through the end of October, I think, roughly. Yeah. Um, so we'll see how it sort of goes from there. But um, I think they're fully aware. I'm sure that that people are are anxiously awaiting season two, and I think we're all excited to present the best possible product, you know, imaginable. So. Somehow those two things will merge in a way that uh, hopefully comes soon, but uh, warrants you know our greatest attention until then. Sure. I want to go back to the beginning of growing up. Oh boy, your lineage. Tell me about your lineage. <laughs> it sounds like an episode. It sounds like a series on HBO. Yeah. The Romanovs. Tell me. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Or mutt. <laughs> I'll be a mutt. Yeah, I'm a mutt. Um, I. I grew up in a very interesting and unorthodox family. I'm Uruguayan my, on my father's side. I'm, I'm of Uruguayan descent. On my mother's side, Italian and Russian. And there's a whole lot of other things mixed up in there. Um, so I grew up speaking Spanish, understanding Italian, and generally eating dinner about four hours later than the rest of my American friends. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I grew up on Long Island uh, in Port Washington, and uh, gosh, where do I start? My mother, hi mom, my mother married two Uruguayan men. <laughs> Most people don't know two <laughs> Uruguayan men. My mother managed to marry two Uruguayan men. Arcelis is Basque, actually, so northern Spanish. Uh, so. At some point or other, a lot of those folks that settled in Uruguay and Argentina and Chile are very are of European descent. So um, it's a very European culture down there. Um, and on my mom's side, do you mind if I get into it, Mama? All right. On my mom's side, her mother, my grandmother, was the last born Romanov princess of Russia. So my great grandmother, her mother, was the princess of Montenegro. Her father was King Peter of Serbia. She married the second cousin to Tsar Nicholas and lived and settled in, in St. Petersburg. So 
we have access to a very special and very personal account of the Russian Revolution and thereafter um, from her perspective. Um, when I was back in college, you know, we had this January term, which was, we had the fall semester and the spring semester. And in January, you could take something sort of unorthodox, whether it be European literature and cinema or basket weaving, I mean, all kinds of weird stuff. Um, and for two of my years, I did an independent study. My junior year, I did an independent study where I took her memoirs and translated them from French because she actually ended up settling in the south of France after, after the revolution. She had come out, I'll come back around to it, but she had come out publicly in, I think it was 1954, 55, in a French periodical with her personal account of the Russian Revolution, um, which she had been quiet about since the end of the revolution, I mean silent about since the end of the revolution, because she wanted to explain away this woman who claimed to be Anastasia, Anna Anderson. She was like, she's not Anastasia, and I'll tell you why. And she went on to tell this very personal account of, of her time during the revolution and her escape, literally, from Siberia and, and you know, the certain fate of, of much of that side of, of our family. Um, and so I worked for a month on, on researching the story and putting it sort of in a historical context. And, and it's, it's something very personal to me that I'm, it will probably be a lifelong project that I'm gonna continue to, to uh, look into. But, but you know, what's amazing to it too, not to get too personal here, but my, my father-in-law has amazing projects that he hones in on. So for a couple of years, he'll focus on photography. For a couple of years, he'll be a Civil War buff. The last couple of years of his life, uh, he has spent endless nights creating a family history for my family. And so he used this reunion Mac program and he literally inputted 1,600 different family entries, okay? And he has found links to literally virtually every royal family in, of the European sort of, you know, thing. So what's fun about it is I can literally, I told Kevin Spacey the other day, who very famously did Richard III for a year before doing Richard III on our show. Um, <laughs> or, you know, a version, a nugget of Richard III. Um, that I plugged in sort of the connection between my brothers and I and Richard III, and he's my 17th great uncle. Like, how weird is that? That's fascinating. I, I it sounds like I'm yeah. like being all, you know. No, it's I not. love it. It's, it's really interesting because yeah. I can literally, I was like, well, now this is interesting. And you stick in a name and, you know, like Harry and William, they're my ninth cousins. <laughs> <laughs> Drop the mic. That's what I see. I see a miniseries in here. Yeah, well. <laughs> Starring you, the story <laughs> right, of your life. Right, right, right. Wouldn't that be self-indulgent? Did you have creative outlets growing up? Did you want to growing up? Yeah, you know, it's funny. A lot, <clears throat> yes. I was, I, I never thought of myself as having a career as an actor. You know, I was a ham, for sure, as so many of our actors are, and fellow brethren. You know, I did little shows at the house, and Snoopy shows, and God knows what else, and I sang in the choirs, and I did the, all the school plays, but I never really studied theater until, like, late high school and, and, and college. Um, what I found, as so many of us do, is that I is that I could make people laugh. I could make my family laugh, really. Not other people. They found me less interesting. <laughs> and, and, and it wasn't like I really, I think, anyway, I don't think that I loved sort of the attention, per se. I mean, we all do to a certain degree, but it, and it wasn't the fact that it made me feel good to make people laugh. It was that it made them feel good, you know? And so, I think I, in, in our family anyway, I settled into a role which was sort of the funny one and the, and the, and the, the showy one and the one that was dramatic, as it were. And uh, my parents, you know, like you were saying, growing up in this amazing sort of family, we, 
they made me very aware of the arts. We came into New York City all the time to museums, to shows. Um, and on top of that, we had this whole other world that existed, which was because of our heritage, because of my, 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 my stepfather's uh, experiences in Uruguay in the 60s and, and the political oppression that happened at the time. I grew up in a very socially conscious family, one where morality and social justice and, and fairness and, and, I mean, so many other grand ideas were prevalent. That satisfied sort of this political context that I was living in. On the other hand, I had this artistic world that I was living in, which I know came directly from my mother, who was a great actress and a great writer, and for any number of, of life reasons, um, had to, uh, didn't pursue that as a, as a career, but, uh, but now she's a great photographer, so she's found her outlet. And, um, and so I had these two worlds that were sort of beating up against each other, sort of working together, and uh, anyway, I gave over to the political side. And I went to college, and I studied US involvement in Latin America in the 20th century. Um, which basically was born out of inter interests in international relations and the Foreign Service, but, but the irony is that once I got through college, I didn't really want to be a lawyer, I didn't really want to go into business, and, and I was sort of overwhelmed by, well, I'm going on tangents here, but oftentimes it's the things you don't do that end up really fueling your life, right? And this is a stupid example, but it's, it's actually, very, it's a seminal moment sort of for me. My junior year of high school, I had been doing all the plays, and you know, in high school, it's like, if you can sing, then you're one of three guys who plays the leads in the, in the play. And there were three of us who could sing. So, but junior year rolled around, they were doing a production of Grand Hotel, and my, it was the one time that my mother said to me, you can't do it. You should focus on your studies. Focus on on your SATs. And I'm not saying that to make you sound evil. I'm saying <laughs> it was supportive. She knew what I really wanted was, you know, to get those grades up so I could get into that school, right? But I, it was more like, I don't think you should embrace this particular opportunity. There'll be another. And by not doing Grand Hotel, I was, I was heartbroken. Granted, I did better on the SATs and I got into Williams. But, uh, but ironically enough, the first show that I did out of college where I got to work with equity actors was Grand Hotel at the Gallery Players in Park Slope, Brooklyn. Isn't that something? Wow. Isn't that something? And, and so somehow or other, it all sort of comes together. There was another moment in college where I made that decision. It was my sophomore year, and another fellow actor, Broadway actor, you may know, David Turner. Sure. Yeah, he wrote a musical. And he was very much sort of lobbying for me to be a part of it and to, 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 to be one of the stars in it. And I said, you know what, David? I gotta focus on my studies. Because at that point, you know, I wanted to change the world in that way. And, uh, and I didn't do it. And I cried through the whole thing when I saw it. And to this day, he, you know, gives me crap for not having done it. But I say, but it made me an actor. It made me want to be an actor. And uh, so it's those little things where I had this very artistic uh, support system, but it's always those one or two out of 15 or 20 things that you don't do that really fuel your desires. And so I came out of college. Am I, am I going on too long here? No, I was going to ask you what that defining moment was when you said, I'm going to be an actor. Yeah, well, those were little moments leading up to the summer before my senior year. I did that very uh, uh, typical trek through Europe where I did 10 different uh, countries in 10 weeks on the three grand that I had saved working in, you know, a little computer factory in uh, Miami, Florida where my dad lives. I spent my summers down there. Anyway, I went to Europe and I did this amazingly, like just overwhelmingly lush artistic trip where I had just taken a year and a half of art history and I was getting to see these works and I was living on bread and just loving every second of it. And, and, uh... The life of an actor. Right? 
I had things no, to come. I had no money. I just, but I loved every second of it. And I got back. It was before my senior year of college, and I said, you know what? I got to give it a shot. I have to play into all of these things that I'm fighting. I have to just embrace my sort of natural desires, which was to give it a shot. But so you know, I studied that year, and I focused more of my attention towards acting. But I still had to fulfill a, a degree in political science. But even my studies, you know, it was like U.S. It was like the Foreign Service, or you know, European foreign policy of the major powers, which then became Latin American politics, which then became rebels and revolution in Latin America. Which then I started to realize, even in my own political studies, I was studying the um, the drama of politics more than I was the art of politics. You know, I was like studying people and the way they thought and the psychology and all that. And to this day, I wouldn't change a thing. I, I'm glad I didn't go to conservatory. I mean, it, it provided, it led to an uphill battle when I got out of school, but all of those little things mattered to me, and they still do, and I look very fondly on my college years. And, uh, and even, you know, you look at House of Cards or A Time to Kill, and they are a part of who I am because they are part of my history, you know, and they're part of my present now, and, and so I feel authentic, and I feel like I can approach each of those opportunities with a certain degree of knowledge and uh, a familiarity with them because of the things that I studied. You made your Broadway debut as Roger in the musical Rent. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Th Thanks. There's nothing like the Broadway debut. No. What was that whole experience like for you? And do you remember your first performance on stage that night? Absolutely. In fact, in first I was a, a swing in the show for eight months um, before taking over the role of Roger. So the first, my actual Broadway debut was as Gordon. I had gotten cast, um, I'd gotten cast, you know, I started performing, I started working there on like a Tuesday. And I had eight different characters to look at. Mark, Roger, and four ensemble tracks, including Mr. Jefferson, which I did perform. <laughs> and, uh, and luckily I was conscientious, you know, and, and a good student, so uh, I knew how to sort of approach that. And luckily, Gordon was the first role that I focused on because the gentleman who played Gordon got strep throat and the other cover for him had to go on for Roger. And so I was on stage within like, I don't know, five days. And my Gordon starts, out, all the characters in Rent start the show, you know, in different, like situated all throughout the stage, right? And we're all wearing five different layers of clothing. My mother, I told her that I was coming in, she came to the show that night, she raced from Long Island to come see the show, got there just in time for curtain, was standing in the back, and she said that from the back of the theater, she could see my my jacket, my heart just <laughs> pumping. It was literally like this. This is not a joke. And I definitely remember that experience vividly. Not the rest of it, but um, I was on for Roger within a couple weeks too, and and again, it's one of those moments where, you know, Rent was a show that I saw, was blown away by for any number of reasons. Um, and I was that guy, again, fairly eager beaver, who showed up and was asking all former cast members, anyone I can get my hands, give me, like, history. I want to know what it was like. I want to know what Jonathan was thinking. I want to know what it was about. I want to feel this. I want to live it. Because, you know, the reality is, I was a more straight-laced sort of version of the kind of guy that was in those shows. I mean, you know, they had authentic rock and rollers that were part of those shows. And I was, uh, I'm a clear-voiced, fairly, you know, I grew up on Long Island and was shopping at the Gap. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a, like, perfect fit from that standpoint. But when you stop and think, how do I make myself real and authentic as a, as a young man who's been locked up in his house for six months, in an apartment for six months, HIV positive, with a girl friend who killed herself in a tub and wrote, you have AIDS on, on the, you know? I mean, it, how do you make that real for yourself? So I soaked up as much as I could. Again, this is a stupid little uh, detail, but the minute I put on those massive boots, I was just like locked down into the ground and I felt weighty. And suddenly, like, everything sort of just changed for me. 
and there were, you know, obviously a lot more that went into it, but but as a, what was so amazing as a swing was, you find yourself in these moments that you can sort of like are out of body. You know, I was sitting there before Glory in the first act, doing that little guitar lick that sort of goes wrong, and you're like, and you hear like funk, 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 and you're like, this cannot be happening right now. <laughs> Similarly, when I played Mark the first time. I leapt up onto the, the table at the beginning of La Vie, La Vie Bohème, and you're like, this can't be happening right now. Um, anyway, I went on to have two and a half really special years where I sort of simultaneously as I was doing the show, I was fairly raw, you know? And so I was learning about what it meant to sustain yourself in this kind of environment while learning you know, while being in a show about that, you know, about living and feeling and enjoying the moment and and living for the moment. And to this day, you know, my family always says no day but today, and it's true. Jonathan created a remarkable piece of theater that, that will live on for many years, and it's so funny to think that now it seems almost dated, but it is, you know. But um, it was a remark, it was a really remarkable time. It was nothing like that show. Anybody who I've spoken to who's done Rent said it, it's changed their life. And most yeah. people started their career out in that show. Yeah, a lot, a lot of us. A lot. Yeah. And, and it's a special thing when you look around to the, the current theater landscape and, you, and, and we're all part of this sort of, I don't know if fraternity is the wrong word, but... Um, it's a family. A family, excuse me, thank you. No, it really is, is a fraternity or it is a family. There's nothing like the theater community. There's TV, there's, there's movies, but the theater community, it's very small yeah. and insular. Yeah. And you've all sort of either done readings together or worked together or, you know, like I said, stood by for somebody in a show or whatever. Yeah, you know those things were, too, like there were so many different companies and, and yeah. such a long run where somehow when you meet someone who you didn't do it with, but when you, when you meet them and you either learn that they did or or you recognize that they did, there's like an immediate like comfort. Yeah. You all feel like you're part of something because that show was special and this, the message was special and, and what Jonathan was trying to put out there into the world, um, it still rings so true today. And sure. So I, I will always look very fondly on those. It was hard. It yeah. was a hard one. You know, there's Vocally hard. Oh, yeah. Emotionally hard. Yeah. 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 No, because like I said, you're the clear-voiced guy. I mean, oh, that's yeah. been rock. Well, I had to dirty it up, and yeah. and that was that was difficult. Um, and you know, I, I did Roger for six months. When, when when they hired me to do Roger for six months, to be very frank, they said, "Look, we like you as Roger, but you're not our prototypical tatted up yeah. rock and roller. So, in, we're gonna look for somebody to do that. And in six months, if you want to be a swing again, you can." And it was a very important lesson to learn as a young actor, not to sort of get haughty. And, and ahead of yourself, like I did it for six months and I went back to being a swing. I went back to working on my craft and I went back, oh, I said that, didn't I? I said working on your craft. I love it. Anyway, but that's I what went you back do. to work. <laughs> I went back to like sort of working hard and appreciating the fact that I had a great job. And yeah. Because, you know, three years earlier, I couldn't afford anything but pizza and soup. And I was working in an office where I had a sure. closet where every day I, I had all kinds of clothes in there to satisfy basically any des demand. And on my lunch breaks or whatever, I would go and audition for stuff while working in an office for three years in New York. And uh, so I never lost sight of the fact that I was very, very blessed to be a part of that. And sure. Yeah. Because after Rent, you did Jan in the Beach Boys musical, That's which right. I loved. I had a great time. I took, you, took my whole family you're to the see only it. one. I think I was the only person who liked the Beach Boys musical. But I live vicariously through the people I take, and I took my family, and they had the best time. I'm glad. I think you lasted you know, a week, right? We, you, I have the Beach Boys still. I have, the, I have the, those <laughs> blow up Beach Balls. It's a funny story yeah. about that. I think one of the reviews actually said something to the effect of, and after all of that, they still had the audacity to pelt us with Beach Balls at the end. <laughs> anyway. I, interestingly, the, uh, Good Vibrations lasted like three and a half, four months. So it was around for a bit, and you, I, I had a really special time because it was an avenue for me to try something new. So I had been in Rent for two and a half years, and I was cast in something new. Uh, interestingly, Justin Guarini had played my role in the Vassar yeah. workshop at the show. He was busy, and, uh, or knew <laughs> <You're something. laughs> what to expect. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I loved singing that music. It is just remarkable, and to this day, I wonder what 
what they, I mean, the Beach Boys story themselves. I wonder if they had done something, you know, Jersey Boys-esque about it and, and what story that would have uh, unearthed with that amazing sort of pulsing music and, and the story of the real band. But, you know, we, to, speaking of family, I mean, I still see that cast around and, and we have a little bond because we were part of something and we tried to make it work and we tried to, to put something happy and, and, and fun out there, but it just didn't work. It was a jukebox musical, obviously, that tried to follow the mold of a Mamma Mia and just, it, it, did, it missed. Um, but, uh, yeah, I played the big kahuna yeah. who... Uh, you have that look still. You could do that. I could see yeah, that. Yeah, right? I'm growing yeah. here a little yeah. bit. You have that sort of, you know, I'll, I'll ride the wild Maybe way I'll do kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. I'll do good, vibra good vibrations via revival. No, but, you know, it's Broadway. You know, I, I always say that, you know, you're, you're out there to entertain an audience. Cheetah always told me, you know, Cheetah had her hits and she had her flop shows too, but yeah. she treated those flop shows just like her hit shows because people are paying money to come to this thing. Oh, for sure. And people walked out of that Beach Boys show. I remember the, the Saturday night we went. They loved it. You know, that's always the, the, the interesting thing about what we do, right, yeah. is that there are, there are critiques of the work that we do, but at the same time, you have to stop and look at what the audience is experiencing. If sure. they're having a good time, then you accomplish something that night. But yeah, we I, all of us didn't approach it with a, a, any degree of levity. We really tried hard to make it special for the audience that came. So what did you take away from that experience of Good Vibrations? Three and a half months, not critically liked by any of the critics or whatever? Well, because I had to be half naked most of the time, I came away with a better physique. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's one thing. <laughs> that didn't last long. Uh, Back to the pizza. A, patient, a certain degree of patience, I think. Yeah. You know, uh, an openness, because you have to try new things, and sure. you have to be willing to accept those new things, and you have to... What we do is inherently um, vulnerable, right? And when you're in something that you can't escape knowing how it's being perceived, you have to sort of steal yourself and and just continue to try to do the best that you can. So sure. that was that was important to me. It was an important lesson, and it and it also uh, there's nothing like opening an original Broadway musical, even if it didn't go well. And that was a sp that was a very special thing for me. I just I just moved recently, my wife and I, and I pulled out the the poster for it, and there was not an ounce of me that felt, oh boy, that was a rough one. It, it was like <laughs> it was for lack of a better term, sunny. They make you who you are later on when you're putting your career together because yeah. you learn things from that. For sure. You know, you learn things. Do you have a room in the house where you keep all your memorabilia, the both of you? We're just... Uh, we're just they, bought a go they bought a gorgeous house. They showed me their house, which is stunning. It's <laughs> like, you know... <laughs> do you have, you could have like a showroom. That, you know, you've all done such well, beautiful shows. You, you have to have that. You know, we try to keep a, a low profile with all that stuff, but... The basement... <laughs> well, we all the way to that. the basement, we, the den. Well, it's funny. We worked from the basement, and we were like, eh, maybe not, to like a little like attic room where we were like, well, that's not pretentious if we put it up there. And then we just had our office, and, and Steph did this great design. We have these great uh, sort of uh, Matt Lovian uh, design, these sort of Hirschfeld-esque sure. images of us in, in in all of our shows. And, and so we put a few of those up in the office and just to have little reminders of, of, of what we do, which sure. is so special. Great. You then went on to play the role of Fierro. Yeah. In the first national tour, you started in the first national tour, Wicked, right? That's right. Oh, I, I replaced uh, Derek Williams in the first national tour. Okay. And then you went to the Broadway production. That's right. What is the best thing that happened to you during Wicked? You know what's coming, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> I married my wife. I met, I met and fell in love with Stephanie J. Block, who, um, and she was green at the time. Uh, and by that, I don't mean inexperienced. Uh, she was the heart and soul of that show for so many years. And, uh, and you know, it's funny. Life is funny. You know, I, I was hesitant to go on the road. Some part of me just didn't want to leave New York. And, but I did. I, I, I was excited to be a part of something that special that had created. The, it was a phenomenon, you know. And I went on the road, and I, I met Steph and um, had a great time you know, traveling the country, it was, it's difficult to be on tour. You know, you wake up in different cities and different conditions, and it, it's just, it, it's a hard, it's a grueling road. And then I was able to come back in to, to do the show in New York, and thankfully Steph was able to join me after a while there, and um, after she had done the Pirate Queen, and, and then we got married. 
and uh, we 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 had a, a wedding outside of that, but but officially we got married um, down at City Hall, and and literally just rode Lion up to our Broadway show and and worked that night together. I love that story. Yeah, we had a, an official sort of thing, but. But a lot of stars did that. I yeah. think, and I, I'm, I don't want to talk off the top of my head, but there were some really famous couples that would literally, I think Jerry Stiller and Anne Mira did the same thing. Is that thing. right? Well, was, if, if they didn't, someone like them did. It was did. very romantic. I, yeah. You know. In between shows or something, or in yeah, a day off. sort of. It, we got married at 3 o'clock and did a show at 8. <laughs> she came, I remember, I remember I hung uh, Coke cans on her dressing room door. <laughs> was it love at first sight? Yeah, for me. On the road? Was it, yeah? Yeah. I mean... In essence, you know, uh, those things take time to sort of evolve. But the minute I met her, I was like, my, my life sort of went into a tailspin. Yeah. Well, after Wicked, you stepped into Bob Gordio yeah. in Jersey Boys. You replaced Daniel, right? That's correct. Right, Daniel Rockard was the original Bob Gordio. Mm. Did a few of you go in, or did you go in by yourself? Michael Longoria went from playing Joe Pesci to Frankie Valli. Okay, so um, two of you went into the show yeah. at the same time. Although, you know, he had been in the show since yeah. the opening, but yeah, two of us went in sort of uh, at the same time. I think Michael may have joined like a week prior. And that was, a, it was one of those, you know, it was one of those marriages, I feel like, of, of, of it was just a time, it was a special time. I mean, I, mean, I was, in, you know, newlyweds. Um, there's something about that role that to this day, yeah. if I can go back and do one one more time, I think it's that one. I mean, it, Bob Gaudi was very sort of, am I being too long-winded? No, okay. you go on. Conversation. All right. Bob Gaudio, for those of you who have seen Jersey Boys or are familiar with the Four Seasons, you know, what's so magical about this show is that we all know Frankie Valli, but we don't really know the specifics of each of these other three guys. And each of them is so distinct and colorful. Bob was the least, you know, you know, of those guys. The most sort of sober, business-like, yeah. um, a very dignified, I don't know if quiet's the right word, but ambitious fella who was the brain sort of behind the group. And and they, what I loved about that show was the evolution of, I mean, the show itself is remarkably written and constructed, and Des and, and, and Rick Ellis and Marshall Brinkman did a remarkable job of that. But um, what I loved about it was the evolution for me of that character from start to finish. I mean, you start out, you meet him, he's 15 and just sort of like wide-eyed, <clears throat> but still shrewd. And by the end, there was just sort of this like wisdom, you know, that that he sort of just imparts. And the way he constructed his career, what he's done beyond, you know, the four seasons themselves is amazing. And, and I always felt a great kinship with him. and. And that's one of those shows that I really, I, I, could, I could be familiar with. Because you went into the show again, right? Didn't you leave for a yeah, while yeah. and go back in again? I did it for a year. And then I had the great fortune of, of doing Happiness at Lincoln Center Theater for, uh, for Susan Stroman. And I remember when I got, I mean, when I got cast in Happiness, it was an original musical directed by Susan, choreographed by Susan, John Wyman did the book, working at Lincoln Center Theater, where truly you feel like an artist. And so I couldn't, I could not do it. But I do remember calling the Dodgers, who were, you know, really gracious, and saying, "I love my job at Jersey Boys. I love coming to work. And I never anticipated a scenario where I would be approaching you about not coming to work here. Is there any world where we can figure something out? You know? <laughs> and anyway, one thing led to another, but." Thankfully, six months later, I was able to come back into the show after working at Lincoln Center Theater and, and enjoy another year, year and change of, of being a part of, uh, of Jersey Boys. And, to, and I have so many dear friends there, and I'm excited to see what Clint Eastwood's going to do with it. Yeah. I want to talk about happiness. I love that musical. What a so gorgeous... Glad. It was written by the team that wrote Grey Gardens. Yes. Oh, my God. Like you said, directed and chore choreographed Scott by Frank Susan Stroman. I mean, they are... An amazing team that, yeah. that understand each other so well, and and John Wyman again doing the book. I mean, he's such a he's a dear friend and such a quintessential like New York guy, and 
Susan, of course, I would travel to the ends of the earth for. I think she's a remarkable woman and 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 talent in this industry, uh, obviously. And and it was it was the first time. That was the first time where I was. I really felt like I'm being trusted with something here that's new, never been done before. It was the first lead in an original part in New York, to be honest. And it was an ensemble piece for sure with an incredible group of people. Um, but I felt a responsibility to get it right. And, you know, we weren't critically acclaimed, um, but people, I think, I like to think, left there feeling reflective about their life and where they might take it the next moment. And uh, it was about a bunch of people that got stuck on the subway that turned out to be a form of purgatory. And you had a, that sounds morbid, but uh, you had a chance, an opportunity to pick your perfect moment in life and live it again. The irony was that I was this uh, sort of just go, 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 get him New York uh, businessman who happened to be the only person that was still alive on the train and didn't have the chance to go back. And so what happened over the course of the piece was that I watched these people and the way they lived their lives, and by the end, I sincerely was begging this sort of, you know, master of ceremonies, as it were, played brilliantly by Hunter Foster, um, the train operator, uh, for another chance. And, uh, you know, in the story, anyway, I earned it. It was brilliant. I mean, it was a Ken Page, Joanna Gleason, oh, Hunter Foster. Yeah. I mean, and it Miguel Cervantes. Yeah. I mean, really, uh, uh, it was, <laughs> man, uh, I'm, sp I'm still speechless when I think about what it. What made Susan Stroman such a brilliant director choreographer to work with? Oh, she's, you could sum her up. Gosh, she's, visually, she has an image for everything that you, you can't even think of, you can't even conceive. You don't know how she conceives of her end game. Mm-hmm. One. Two, she has this remarkable way of guiding you towards the end result while making you think that you figured it out <laughs> along the way. And really, she's there, and she's, she's guiding you. Three, she's lovely. Yeah. And, and, in, and she's in charge, and you trust her implicitly. And, you know, it, it can be anything from the command that she has in a room to her walking past you and just giving you sort of a, yeah. and then walking, and you're just like. You must get all pumped up. Oh, I forget about it. It's yeah. the best. And uh, I loved every second of it. She's yeah. the best. Elf the musical. Awesome. Loved so it. So fun. <laughs> I did. So, yeah. I own it. It's you. Yeah. <laughs> did you love doing that? I did. It yeah. was. Another leading role. Yeah, thankfully. On Broadway. It was the first time I was doing a lead on Broadway, uh, an original show. Bar none, without question, the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Oh, I can imagine. Because you did everything. Physical comedy, singing, dancing, acting. You're I'm tired, tired already. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired just thinking about it. Stop. Was that the hardest thing? Was it the energy? You couldn't... First of all, I, yes. The energy that you have to maintain during that piece, you can't let up. You can't let an ounce of knowing self, real, whatever it is, like, you cannot be self-referential, you cannot, you have to just go with it and be open and be, and be that guy. The minute you drop it, it's over. You know, I remember calling my wife, I was in, I was in a voiceover booking, and uh, I was on a break waiting for client approval, and I called my wife and I was like, I just got a phone call to audition for, wait for it, Buddy in Elf. <laughs> and she's like, oh. <laughs> and I said, and the, the interesting thing about it is both of us almost at the same time was like, that could be perfect. <laughs> because I'm not particularly elfin in nature, you know? Is it elfin, elvin, whatever. I'm not an elf. So, but it was one of those things where 
she and I, anyway, in the comfort of her own home, know how kooky I can be. So, and I've said this before, too, and I, I enjoy this, what I call the, the really factor, which is the notion that you get cast in something and, and you can generally sense that the immediate perception amongst people is going to be, really? <laughs> like, that guy for that? And I enjoy bucking that trend. KC Nicola trusted me with that. And let me tell you something, he is amazing. Because he creates this environment that is fun, free. I mean, his shoes are off and he's literally sitting Indian style. I mean, he's, there's a part of him that's buddy, which is why he was so right for that experience. And, and he, he was just so good to me and so trusting. Funny audition story, if I may. Um, you know, I mean, you get this material and you're like, how do I make it my own while also honoring what people are coming to expect, right? And there's that scene in Macy's, right, where, where Buddy says, when well, actually the store manager says, you know, Santa Claus is coming tomorrow, everybody, so get ready, and, and Buddy flips out, right? And it's all, you know, like, <laughs> Santa's coming, <laughs> you know? And I remember, <clears throat> I'm in the audition room. I will give you credit. Uh, I was in the audition room, and I started saying, Santa Claus is coming to town. And I started freaking out, Santa Claus is coming to town. And I ran over to the door. This is at Telsey's office. I ran over the door, opened the door, and into Telsey's office, I screamed, Santa Claus is coming to town! Like, like, la like, into, there are people auditioning. Like, there's 40 people out there doing stuff. And then I slammed the door again. Now, if we were in a movie, cut to outside that room, my wife accompanied me because I just needed moral support, right? And so she was there in the room with a friend of ours who literally, deadpan, you're Steph. He, uh, he turns to her and he's all, good choice. <laughs> now I'm Steph and he's the friend. And Stephanie turns and says, good direction. That was her nugget, and it, it probably got me the job. But then, you know, it's, that was one of those the, the special rooms, uh, room experiences where you know how you come into an audition and you, oftentimes you just sort of like go to the middle of the room and you sing your song and you try not to feel weird and, you know? And so I did it. I sang the song, it was the world's greatest dad, and then Casey was like, okay, great. Now I want you to really see the room. I want you to see, you're walking from the North Pole to the city. You're walking through the candy cane forest, and you're going over the mountains of gingerbread, and you're doing, and you're thinking, how do I make this real for myself? And I, and I sort of stopped myself, and I was like, all right. And I said to myself, Sebastian, if you're going to do this, you need to go there. And so then I was like, okay. And I got down the floor, and I just, like, you know what I mean? I started, and it was in that moment actually where I developed talking about physical um, attributes. It was in that moment that I decided Buddy's greatest physical attribute that would help me throughout the whole thing, which was, I will never go wrong if Buddy always looks like he has to pee. <laughs> so it was like, you know. So. Fabulous. <laughs> so it was, uh, it, it was so oh. fun. And you know what? Part of the thing, too, was like, I want to do a show where my nieces and nephews can say, my uncle is Buddy. And they can come to open night and be the guests of honor. And I did. But Christmas time, I'm sure it was the wow. best time, New York, yeah. to be starring in a Broadway musical about Christmas yeah, and playing like, the most famous elf. Nothing like New York at Christmas time. And you know... I mean, I got to like open Macy's and stand on the thing and do the. I mean, uh, kids would come up to you and it was kind of like you were Santa Claus. It's like some like hid behind their parents because they didn't know what to do, and some would just bull rush you like you were, you know, like you had candy. I mean, it was like a special. <sighs> Although I saw a video of myself at the cast recording a week after. Um, it was shot a week after we closed, and I was so pale and so gaunt 
and like just dead. I mean, I was so tired. It was really only two and a half months. So when I look at, you know, uh, shows like The Pirate Queen or Alphaba, I was like, how do they do it? But luckily, we were, you know, in and out. But um, it was it was truly one of the most rewarding experiences. Yeah. Like I said, you gave a million percent, and you did everything in that show. Yeah. Every possible task you possibly could do. Yeah. Would you ever want to do Barnum? You know, that would be something, wouldn't it? You'd be great. I'd love that. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Oh, we're gonna are people that watching? Yes, people are watching, and people will watch. <laughs> Barnum, P.T. Barnum. I know Neil is, Neil Patrick, I think, has got hands on that one. Everybody does. Hugh Jackman does. Well, you know, yeah, you right. You too. Right. I'm and third in line. I'm yeah. happy to accept it. Kick the other ones out of the way. <laughs> but you know, you hear those stories all the time of all these stars that finally did Broadway shows, and they were like the third, fourth, or fifth choice. I don't have a problem with that. Perfect. And they become legends. I, I want Your to mouth to God's ear. Trust me, Barnum, we've got it on them. Okay. We've got it out there for you. You played Franz. I loved you in The Blue Flower. I'm so glad you enjoyed that show. What an epic proportion musical. Yeah. You know, just about the artists you all play. Then you go to war. I mean, just a beautiful, beautiful musical at second stage. Yeah. For those of you who don't know it, yeah. it was, oh gosh, it's always so difficult to describe and yeah. it sounds so kooky and bizarre, but it was special. It was a German, Weimar, country western, all told through a fake language that was Dada inspired. Uh, it was about a, a group of artists that some, you know, they, they were that were uh, actually true stories, um, and some that were, you know, uh, sort of bled off of of, of, of true um, artists um, about living through the world wars, and. There's this main character that was play, played brilliantly by Mark Kudish, where he literally had to create his own language out of. He he goes into this sort of state of shock where he um, is essentially rejecting the world and using art as a form of expression. And he literally designed his own language and for whatever, but in the 40, 50 years, I don't know what it was, um, spoke in this language until the moment of his death where he didn't. But um, trying to leave, it was about trying to leave something behind, trying to hold on to an innocence that's not lost through life. And, and Franz, the part that I played, was his best friend, who was sort of the, early on anyway, was sort of the, the life of the party, the, the, the personality, the, the, the center of attention, you know, of the group, who sort of cavalierly decides, I'm going to join the army, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change the world. Um, and is beaten down by the world, and ultimately, so much so that he takes his own life. And and it was told with this amazing music that um, that to this day is, is sort of enchanting and haunting. And and it didn't last very long, but second stage was brave enough to to give it a shot. And and I and I I'm glad that you embraced it. I still have folks that 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 say that that it was one of their. Uh, really special experiences of theater in New York. It had, it had different incarnations in Boston and New York and smaller theaters. And uh, I hope it has a life beyond beyond that production because it, it was really something. Just beautiful. You're about to return to Broadway yeah. in A Time to Kill. I can't wait. So the John Grisham novel has been turned in not only into a film, it's now been turned into a, a play, uh, a stage adaptation by Rupert Holmes. That's right. So you did this at Arena Stage first, right? That's right. So talk about the role you're going to be playing. Yeah, I, well, I'm playing the role of Jake Brigantz, um, who is a lawyer. Well, the story of A Time to Kill, for those of you who don't know, is John Grisham's first novel that he wrote while a lawyer. Um, he, I think, I think the story is that he walked into um, an arraignment at where he heard about a young black girl who was raped by two white men. And those guys were convicted. But he then took that aw awful experience, the thought of that experience, and took it one step further, as it were, and, and just said, what would happen if the father of that young lady, young girl, excuse me, 
um, took matters into his own hands. And so in the book, he shoots those two men while they're being, you know, at their sentencing hearing. And then the book happens over the course of the murder trial for the father. Um, and so Jake Brigantz is his sort of young, white street lawyer, um, the kind of guy who is not part of the big firm across the way that does insurance companies and banks and whatnot, but usually does the kind of jobs where he doesn't get paid or gets paid very little, but he's trusted in town. The kind of guy who thinks that he's more a part of the community than he may be. Um, and <clears throat> anyway, so it was made into a movie, uh, of course, and, and it's interesting, the, the route now that, you know, that we're making a stage adaptation of it. It's John Grisham's first novel to be made for the stage. Um, and Rupert Holmes has created this wonderful adaptation that has taken all the best elements of the book, actually expanded on some of them in ways that have even made John Grisham say, now, why didn't I think of that? Um, and we did this wonderful workshop sort of run of the piece out of town in Arena um, two years ago. And, you know, it's not often in our business where we get to revisit a role that we did when it gets to the later stages. And by some good fortune, I was um, able to, to rejoin the company um, uh, and, and carry forth that, that part to the next stage of the show's development. And, and I can't wait. I mean, Dara Roth is, you know, this is Dara Roth. She's one of the greatest producers that we have. And I could not be more thrilled to work with her. And Ethan McSweeney, who is a brilliant mind, is directing the piece. And we have this remarkable cast topped off with the announcement today that Tom Skerritt is playing yeah. Lucian Wilbanks. Uh, I can't wait to work with him. And um, we have a remarkable, I mean, Fred Thompson, John Douglas Thompson, Ashley Williams. I mean, these great actors are a part of this production. And uh, I really can't wait. And look, at, at this particular time, I mean, I know that when we talk about new shows, we always say it's timely. But in this particular case, it's very timely. We're, we're living in an age where and literally, in, in a currently, in our current affairs, we have a few very specific cases where the question of justice, the question of vigilante justice, the question of vigilante acts is very much on the mind with things as varied as Snowden to George Zimmerman, of course, in, the, in Trayvon Austin. And while... In the, in the case of our particular show, the circumstances are very different and, and the racial ramifications are sort of flipped in essence. Um, it does still call these issues into mind, which what, what I find most interesting is what our show does is it, it actually puts the audience in the jury box. And it's not like we have a vote at the end, it's not that, but, but you are by design very much the folks that are being talked to in the jury. And so by the end of it, I mean, you'll walk out of the theater saying, I would have voted this way, this way or I would have voted that way. And aren't we basically that when we're watching our TVs at night or watching MSNBC or Fox News, or what have you, and deciding for yourself, how would I have voted in this or how would I approach this scenario or, or what do I, what's my responsibility today um, in this society? So I think it, it, it's very, it's timely, and it's also a riveting story that's told very, uh, very brilliantly and 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 appropriately, and by Rupert. He Rupert has this amazing quality, which is he's very comprehensive, and he's very, um, I mean, he's a brilliant writer. He also knows when to release the audience. He knows when to allow for some breath allow for some tension release, allow for some humor, allow for a uh, moment of reflection. So it really does feel like a very southern, very, but very sharp rendition of the story. I can't, I really can't wait for audiences to see it. I think, I think they'll be, uh, I think they'll have a good time. So what was it like, because you work with John Grisham, did he come a lot at the arena? He came, he came to the arena. Here's my Letterman story with regard to John uh, Grisham, or my Ridge story, as it were. <laughs> Um, so, John Grisham came to the opening, lovely, congenial, fairly quiet guy, you know, he's handsome, he's, he's an imposing figure, uh, and 
brilliantly successful. We can't argue with that. There was a scene where I'm in my house, uh, and I'm sort of, you know, meandering about. With regard to that scene, I, a couple weeks later, I said to, to Ethan, the director, so what did Grisham really think? Like, what did he think? Oh, I don't know what he thought. You know, he said, well, the, he loves the play. He's excited and, uh, about its progress and, and thinks that Rupert came up with some great nuggets and blah, 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 blah. He's like, he had one note for you, though. I was like, oh, oh yeah, tell me, tell me. He said, he would never wear flip-flops. <laughs> I wore flip-flops in this scene. And it's no secret that I think there are elements of Jake Brigance that are somewhat autobiographical or, you know, told from his standpoint of being a lawyer. So I don't know if it was Jake Brigance would never wear flip-flops or John Grisham will never get caught dead in flip-flops. <laughs> Needless to say, they were out that night and I was barefoot. Okay. So there will be no flip-flops in our Broadway, Broadway production of A Time to Go. So have you done any readings with the new cast? Or you we just did it on Monday. We had our first read-through on Monday. Tell us. It was so exciting. It was so exciting. It's great to be back on stage. And we actually literally did it on a stage, so... But it's great to be approaching a theater rehearsal period again. Um, the cast is electric. Uh, Patrick Page is playing Rufus Buckley. I mean, can you think of a more appropriate casting? I mean, we're going to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe and I can't wait. Um, that voice, oh my god. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was a read-through that was happening two weeks before we start rehearsals. We start on the 26th. And it just made us all want to start rehearsal the next day. Um, it must be amazing for you to be doing a play now as opposed to a musical. Yeah, it's so fun to just say words. <laughs> <laughs> you know, instead of waking up and be like, oh, 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 you know. Uh, you know, it's a fun story. I don't think he would, it's like I'm betraying any confidence, but uh, Steph and I went to see The Normal Heart a couple years back, and oh my God, what a remarkable piece of theater. Yeah. I mean, truly, it might be one of the greatest theatrical experiences I've ever experienced, as I'm sure all of us probably did. And, you know, through Wicked and, and, and 9 to 5, of course, we've got to know Joe Mantello very well. And we popped back to see Joe, who played Ned brilliantly. And we said to him, we said, Joe, how do you, how do, you do that? How do you do that every night? How do you just, I mean, every human emotion imaginable, like, how can you get through one of those, much less eight a week? And Joe was like, well, it's not a musical. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you work doubly hard, but it's like I don't have to sing. Yeah. But you must have some kind of vocal preparation, because you have a lot yes. of dialogue in this no, no, show. Yeah, and, and it, this is, I mean, big sweeping, you know, yeah. opening and closing arguments. I mean, you know, it's a very intense trial. So, of course, there's, there's vocal warm-ups. To be frank with you, I do the same prep that I do as if I'm doing a musical, because it's actually quite musical. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but it is interesting. When I was down in, I had just come off of doing Elf when I was down at Arena, and uh, a great friend who was playing Rufus at the time, Brennan Brown, uh, who doesn't do musicals, I'll put it that way. Uh, he was like, we got Buddy playing Jake Brigance. <laughs> Buddy, <laughs> the Elf. <laughs> Like, he, you know, like, it'd be like 10.30 in the morning, I'd finish a scene, he'd be like, good job, buddy. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm sorry, you're an actor who does plays. I was like, let me tell you something, it's 10.30, you would have been through the opening number probably seven times, sweating from head to toe. Trust me, you're doing half of our job. <laughs> and every joke, you know, of course, we have a long-running joke about it, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's different. It's different, um, but it... It requires no less commitment, of course. Yeah. It, you know what, if I may? Yeah. Uh, going back to House of Cards and film and TV versus theater, it's kind of like uh, the way we've described it a bit, me and a couple friends, is uh, doing theater is almost like a marathon. It feels like a marathon. It's like a constant all-day preparation for the long haul over the course of the week. Doing film and TV is like doing really, really intense sprints, you know? Even though it's a long 17-hour, 20-hour day, like you have a minute there to like recover, and it's almost like lactate builds up in your in your muscles, and then it's boom again, boom again. Whereas, you know, theater is this endurance thing, but you know, both have 
they're hard to argue with them. On the one hand, you have this electric audience that you feed off of, and on the other, um, you have the opportunity to create something that lasts forever. Yeah. I want to talk about your film, which I'm dying to see. I saw the trailer. The Last Day of August, he stars in and also co-produced. Yeah. New indie film. Yeah. How did that all come about? You know, in this day and age, of course, young artists want to create new content. They want to get their work out there. They want to be a part of something special. And sometimes, in the absence of an, of an actual, quote unquote, legitimate opportunity, you create something in that vacuum for yourself, for the world, for your friends, whatever it may be. I have two very dear friends of mine from college, Michael Esquerdo and Craig DeFalco. Michael went to graduate acting at NYU and Craig went to Columbia Film School as a writer and producer. And we've worked together for many years on a number of small projects, shorts, this and that. We did this uh, online web series back before web series were not sort of a dime a dozen. Um, it was like 2006, seven. And we did like 43 to nine minute um, episodes, you know, all this sort of stuff. Anyway, it got to the point where we were like, we want to go to the next step. We want to try something new. We want to go further. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a lot like you get to stages in your life, you know, where you're in over your head and you just throw yourself out there. I'll give you an example. When I first started and came out of college, because I didn't go to conservatory, because I didn't know anything about how to do the business side of stuff. I went to the New York Performing Arts Library and I listened to every damn musical there was and I copied the music and I taught myself. I read those ridiculous books on auditioning which tell you how to, you know, and it wasn't until you throw those over your shoulder and wear jeans and a t-shirt and are yourself that you actually book jobs. This was one of the cases where it was, I literally went on Amazon.com and was like, how to produce a independent feature. And I bought two books, I read three chapters, and I threw it over my shoulder, and I said, let's just get into the trenches and do it. And so we created a schedule for ourselves, and uh, actually, it was a fast schedule for a feature film. I, I, I called my friends on, in December, three years ago, two years ago, and I said, literally, I miss being smart. I miss making something special that we have the power to. We're all doing our, our careers independently, but we have the power to create something collectively. Let's do it. So we threw out some ideas, and a month and a half later, Craig, the writer, came back with his wife, Sarah Rempe, and we, they had the bones of a script, a, a sh film that we could shoot for $7,000 or $700,000. It was all based around a number of actors in one main or two main locations. And we chose an idea, we, we chose a budget, and we started crafting sort of the production around that. Of course, everything balloons, but over time. But it was just about trial and error, and there were many errors. But we shot on the red, which is the great, you know, the high, you know, high end, highest end um, digital camera. We had, you know, within six months, we were on set, on location in Cambridge, New York, on a farm with 20 crew members, eight cast members. I mean, honoring turnaround, doing, you know, paying overtime when we didn't have the money to pay on time, you know? <laughs> and uh, we shot for 13 days, and within six months, had a final draft, and. And I think we're going to have a theatrical release this October. And when I say theatrical re release, yeah, I'm going to hold your applause. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't mean like the Weinstein Company came in and is giving us a theatrical release. I mean like we're renting the quad and we're going to play it for a week and, you know, try and get a couple people to write about it. And it's a grassroots, not, now you can applaud, no, I'm just kidding. Um, it's a grassroots organization that is from the ground up, that's based entirely on word of mouth and Twitter and getting people in the seats. And it's a, it's a little story about incremental change in people's lives, uh, or I should say incremental recovery based on massive changes in life. I should tell you the story. Essentially, a young man uh, gets into a terrible car accident and loses the use of his legs. 
this story is about six months after the accident. It takes place over the course of one day as his best friends and ex-fiance come up to a cabin that he has basically become a recluse in and try to get him to re-engage his life. And it's about different people's responses to trauma and, and different ideas as to what is or is not a form of recovery. And we don't necessarily take sides. What's, what's what I think fun about the film is that it's sort of European in style. It, it, it meanders back and forth and your allegiances change. But in the end, hopefully something has affected this young man's life so that he might continue down a path of his choosing that is productive. Well, I can't wait to see it. I love the trailer. The trailer's wonderful. Well, thanks. So what were the challenges of wearing both hats as actor and producer? Well, you go into it thinking that acting, I mean, the acting part of it was I didn't even have time to really think about. I mean, I thought about it. I knew the character. I knew what I wanted to do. But um, production really took most of the effort. And... Um, you know, you think if you go into this image of, you know, we're going to do this sh movie shoot for two weeks up and wherever, and you think I'm going to be a creative producer, I'm going to be behind the monitor, and I'll be able to sort of whisper in the director's ear. It's not that at all. What it was was, I need you to go down to Stewart's and grab some ice. We're down on yogurt. <laughs> Someone's got to clean that damn kitchen. <laughs> and where the heck, like, there were moments where we literally had to, like, like make sure that we didn't, I mean, there were like bears that would come and eat the. I mean, it was like you know, it was a, it was all about maintenance. I mean, we didn't have the team that would literally you know make for a fluid film in the sense that you. But that said, we ran a professional organization that had catering and that honored the sort of rules of the game. Um, but it was very difficult to wear both hats and. And my co-producer, Michael Esquerdo, who was amazing as a producer on the film, was also the main character in the chair, in the wheelchair. So he had to stay in a place. And he was in the majority of the film. So, so uh, we had to enlist friends, family, wives, to help uh, get through a day and, and keep everybody on set from feeling like we were as frantic as we were. But you have Vincent D'Onofrio told me the same story. I mean, Ed Burns, I mean, it's, they all start the same way. Well, Ed Burns actually is sort of, Ed Burns, the Duplass brothers, uh, you know, gosh, I mean, Ed Burns' idea of micro features and micro budget filmmaking is the, the perfect example of what we were trying to do, which is why am I going to try and create a film that is going to be one to two million dollars to make that people are only going to see in a small theater in New York or L.A.? Why aren't I trying to cater a smaller budget, or in his case, they're bigger budgets, of course, because he has the funding, but why aren't I trying to create a feature that I can get online to 40 million people in a perfect world? And <clears throat> we have the avenue these days to create that kind of content. It's just a question of getting it out there, and you have to have a certain degree of success to be able to do it in the most optimal way. But the best part of it is we, we've, we've submitted the film to a number of film festivals. We've, we've, we've premiered in, in, in some really wonderful places like New Hampshire Film Festival and IFFP Boston, um, IFF Boston, uh, alongside these great movies that, you know, Weinstein is supporting, but, um, and it's great to meet all the other filmmakers that are trying to do the same thing you are, and it, and it emboldens you, and in fact, my co-producer, Michael, has already made two other films in that time, and uh, so we're trying to start a collective, we're trying to have, we have a company of actors, a company of technicians, you know, we're cashing in on favors, but also creating an environment where people uh, that maybe were working at a certain level want to work on a feature are willing to lend their remarkable talents or in, for instance, in one case, a ridiculous sound studio to be able to mix the film, you know? So a film that might cost X number of dollars, which are not many, might actually have a value of a couple hundred thousand, you know what I mean? So sure. that's a, it's a, special, it's a special process that was very difficult and that's ongoing. We're still working on it. It's been two and a half years. 
Is there a dream role you'd like to play, either on stage or on screen? Oh, boy. There are, there are many. I mean, um, on screen is a difficult one to answer because I think it's, I think it's one that's not written yet. But um, unless it were one that I wrote, you know, like I mean, in a perfect world, I'd write my family history in a way that honored them, sure. and that I could be a part of on some level. Um, on stage, on stage, there are there are a number. Um, one would be, well, we've already Barnum's out of the way. We're doing that one. So you're already you're already cast in that. That's sure. coming to Broadway. All right, all right. Uh, me and my girl. I would I would enjoy very much. Um, gosh, I was just a couple couple days ago we were talking about it, and I, I'm trying to remember what the other one was. A dream role that I that I I played, I had the joy of playing that I would love to revisit was Homer in Floyd Collins, which I consider to be yeah. one of the greatest musicals ever written. Uh, I'd love a crack at George in Sunday in the Park with George. Um, Those are good roles. It would, yeah, well, <laughs> it would seem, gosh, I would just would love to work with Stephen Sondheim. You know, I, who doesn't, you know? Sure. Um, you know, I'm sure 15 other ones will come up to, will come to mind as soon as we're done, but uh, those are a couple that I'd love to Michael, that's a good list. My final question is, what's the best bit of advice that you've been given that you still live by? <clears throat> One is a quote that is advice in a way. And uh, it's courtesy of my stepfather, courtesy of a uh, well, Latin revolutionary. But uh, it's, hay que endurecerse pero sin perder la ternura jamás. Which translates roughly to you have to discipline yourself or s steel yourself without ever losing your tenderness. Beautiful. Um, another one, which is courtesy of my stepfather, only my stepfather, is I have a tendency to be somewhat apologetic, and his is don't be sorry, be right. <laughs> That usually drew the m every bit of rancor from me, yeah. but uh, but now I think I appreciate it in a different way. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Sebastian. Thank you for having me. You are in the not even the the middle of your career. It's somewhere between the beginning and the middle somewhere. You were doing so many great things. You open on Broadway October twentieth at the Golden Theater. Go and see him in A Time to Kill. Please I thank you so us. much. Thank you. It was a great honor. Thank you.